my students who are prepared to speak to come stand here together and all you all you go ahead and you know what you guys go go around this way so that you're behind them so you can hear and everything because you're all kind of out of the way here All right, the students of PS229 would like to first present the details of the tragic event. In 1911, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was the largest shirtwaist manufacturer in New York City and possibly the country. The factory thrived on the cheap labor of immigrants flocking to New York City from Europe. In many cases, these immigrants fled oppressive nations, carrying with them their sewing skills, which they passed down to the younger generations of their families. These immigrants were exploited and forced to work long hours with little pay in the textile factories in New York City. According to one survey taken in the 1890s, the average work week in a textile shop was 84 hours, 12 hours for every day of the week. Entrepreneurs Max Blank and Isaac Harris, who also happened to be in-laws, knew that there was money to be made, so they embarked upon a plan to open the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. The shirtwaist, or ladies' blouse, was one of America's first fashion trends to transcend the class divide. The waist and skirt combination both symbolized a wave of women's liberation and the shirt waist was appropriate for working in a factory or attending ladies' temperance meetings. In 1900, Blank and Harris moved into a building named for the developer Joseph Ash. They outfitted the space with machines and began to manufacture their products. By 1909, the business leased the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of the Ash building, employing hundreds of workers. As the factory expanded, the owners, Blank and Harris, felt pressured by union organizers who felt that the workers were being treated poorly. Blank and Harris felt that the best defense against the union infiltration was to lock the workers in. This proved to be a devastating decision when the fire broke out in 1911. The Triangle Shirt was tragedy is noted as the worst factory fire in the history of New York City. The company employed 500, mostly Italian and Jewish immigrants, between the ages of 13 and 23, in an effort to keep the workers at their sewing machines and to keep out union organizers. The owners had locked doors leading to the exits. You know, I asked these young people just to pose a moment. One of the things that we discussed was asphyxiation. 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 And I can't even pronounce it. And they knew it like this. This young man raised his hand knew exactly what it meant. So this is what we mean by a good class, uh, all classes are good. This is an honest class. And I'm glad that they all know that what the word asphyxiate means. Because I hardly knew what it meant. <laughs> now listen guys, these people have come a long way and they're standing out in the cold, so they want to hear you. So louder. Go ahead. <laughs> the fire began shortly after 4.30 p.m. in the cutting room on the eighth floor. And fed by thousands of pounds of fabric, it spread rapidly. Panic, uh, panicked workers rushed to the stairs. The freight elevator and the fire escaped in an effort to evacuate. Most on the 8th and 10th floors escaped. However, dozens trapped on the 9th floor died, unable to force open the locked door that would have led to their escape. The rear fire escape had collapsed and collapsed, killing many and eliminating an escape route for others still trapped. Some tried to slide down elevator cables but lost their grip while others jumped to their death from open windows. Pump engine company 20 and ladder company 20 arrived quickly but were hindered by the bodies of victims who had jumped. Witnesses thought the owners were tossing their best fabric out the windows to save it, then realized workers were jumping, sometimes after sharing a kiss. The ladders of company 20 extended only to the sixth floor and life nets broke when workers jumped in groups of three and four. Additional companies were summoned by four more alarms transmitted in rapid succession. Onlookers by the hundreds hurried toward the action, the fastest among them in time to see the tangles of bodies, some trailing flames, tumbling from the nine-floor windows of the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. 
A total of 146 workers died in less than 15 minutes. Although there was widespread rage over the working conditions that had contrib contributed to the fire, many defended the right of shop owners to resist government safety regulation. The owners of the company were charged with manslaughter and later acquitted. In 1914, the owners were ordered to pay damages in the amount of $75 to each of the families of 23 victims who had sued. The Factory Investigating Commission of 1911 established the Borea of Fire investigation under the direction of Robert F. Wagner, which gave the fire department additional powers to improve factory safety. The event helped efforts to organize workers in the garment district and in particular for the International Ladies Garment Union. It remains one of the most vivid symbols for the American labor movement and the constant reminder that government must ensure a safe workplace. Okay. Um. Max Blank and Isaac Harris made millions of dollars. So $75 was not a lot of money even back then for them. Now we will have some readings of actual testimonials and survivors. The three girls here will be um, <coughs> reading actual interviews by the people. First we have Diana Rodriguez. She will read from The Story of a Sweatshop Girl. An autobiography by Sadie Frown, a Jewish girl from Poland, dated 1902. Sadie Frown actually was not in the fire, but it gives a very good idea of what it was like to work in a sweatshop. Days and Dreams by Sadie Frown. First published in The Independent, September 25th, 1902. My name is Sadie Frown. I work in Island Street, Manhattan, in what they call a sweatshop. I am new at the work, and the foreman scolds me a great deal. I get up at half past five o'clock every morning and make myself a cup of coffee on the oil stove. I eat a bit of bread and perhaps some fruit, and then go to work. Often, I get there as early as six o'clock, so as to be on time, though the factory does not open till seven. At seven o'clock, we all sit down to our machines, and the boss brings to each one the pile of work that he or she is to finish during the day, what they call in English, the stint. The, this pile is put down beside the machine, and as soon as a garment is done, it is laid on the other side of the machine. Sometimes the work is not all finished by 6 o'clock, and then the ones who are behind must work overtime. The machines go like mad all day because the faster you work, the more money you get. Sometimes, in my haste, I get my finger caught, and the needle goes right through it. It goes so quick, though, that it does not hurt much. I bind the finger up with a piece of cotton and go on working. We all have accidents like that. All the time we are working, the boss walks around, examining the finished garments, and making us do them over again if they are not just right. So we had to be careful as well as swift. But I am getting so good at the work that within a year, I will be making $7 a week. The machines are all run by full power, so at the end of the day, one feels so weak that there is great temptation to lie right down and sleep. But you, must, but you must go out and get air and have some pleasure. So instead of lying down, I go out, sometimes to dance or the theater. Okay. Now, Madalena Carasoni will read from the interview of Anna Pedoni a four lady on the ninth floor of the factory. Mary Leventhal and I had paid all the people on the ninth floor. We went from machine to machine and gave out the pay envelopes. I went over near the freight elevator where the button was and rang the bell for everybody to stop work at 4.45. That was the end of the day. I didn't know there was a fire and I went to the dressing room. Suddenly someone ran to the dressing room and cried fire. I came out of the dressing room and saw everything was in flames. I ran to the front door, but the door was locked. Many people began to go to the windows to jump from them. My sister was age 25. She worked with me on the ninth floor as, as an examiner. During the time, we were running around to get out. I kept hollering for her, but I could not find her for even a minute. The people began to throw themselves out of the windows. All the machines were bubbling with flames. I had my fur coat and hat with two feathers and a green woolen skirt which I pulled over my hat and my head. 
I know I ran to the windows, but then I backed away. I know I was all wet, but it could not have been from the fireman's hose. I cannot remember whether I wet myself with a pail of water or somebody threw it at me. I ran back toward the freight elevator through the open aisle, which was the last aisle after the machines, and I went to the back staircase door. I remember there was a big barrel of oil near that door, and when I opened the door and ran through and began to go down the staircase, I heard a loud bursting noise. Maybe the barrel of oil exploded. When I went to the window, I made the sign of the cross and was ready to jump, but I didn't have the courage. I remember also that one of the women came back later that afternoon to get pay and died in the fire was somebody that was supposed to get married on Sunday. I went down the staircase all the way down to the hall downstairs and I didn't meet a soul, not a single soul. I remember when I went past the eighth floor, I looked through the door and all I could see was one massive fire. Everything was burning. The wind was blowing up the staircase and the fire was going the other way. When I got downstairs, I was cold and wet, and I remember a man who was looking for his sister and gave me his coat. By the time I got to the ground floor, I was dizzy and I lost my balance. I kept crying. Where was my sister? We found her at 2 o'clock in the morning at the morgue. A week before, I got my neighbor a job at Harrison Blank. She had five, she had five children. She was burned to death. Finally... Kira Keo will read the interview of Rose Cohen, a worker and survivor of the Triangle Factory fire. My father told me one night that he had found work for me in a shop where he knew the presser. I was eager to begin life on my own responsibility, but I was also afraid. The shop was on Pelham Street, and inside I sat at a crowded table between two men and stitched as fast as I could. I noticed that it was a piecework shop. And because I stitched a lot of pieces, the girls disliked me. A little louder. Seven o'clock came around, and I wanted to leave as my father instructed, but, but seeing that no one else was leaving, I stayed. After working at the sweatshop for some time, I came to realize that the boss was taking advantage of me because I was a child. The shop had poor working conditions, and the hours were too long. I did not leave the sweatshop in fear of losing a day or even more in finding other work. To lose a dollar would mean it would be longer before my mother and the children came to New York. Rose Cohen, having escaped the fire and made her way home, sobbed herself to sleep on her bed in the dark bedroom of a long railroad flat on Lewis Street. No one was home when she arrived. In her sleep, she heard shouting and opened her eyes to darkness. Down the long line of rooms in the kitchen, her cousin Harry was shouting and crying. He had made the rounds looking for Rose and had been unable to find her. He feared the worst had happened. My mother asked him what had happened. He began to tell her about the fire. I got up from bed and began the long walk to the kitchen, passing through one room after another as in a dream. Finally, I stood in the kitchen doorway, supporting myself by holding onto the door frame. Then everything broke apart. My mother took one look at me and collapsed to the floor. I began to cry and scream hysterically. I couldn't stop crying for hours, for days, says Rose. Afterwards, I used to dream I was falling from a window screaming. Thank you.